Okay, it sounds like we're going to get started now. Uh, so thanks for everyone from coming from lunch and joining us. Uh, my name is Craig Souls, and this is work I've done uh, with my colleagues Garth Goodson and Tanya Shastri. And today I'll be talking about how at Natero we've enabled data management uh, for the big data world. So let me start by just describing a little bit about the problem with data management in Hadoop, which I think you've heard a lot about over the last couple of days, but Hadoop is really a collection of tools. And the problem with this is that it's not tightly integrated the way the traditional systems are. Which means, one, that everyone's stack looks a little bit different. Um, you know, everyone uses different parts of the tool chain and they're doing it in different ways. But it also means that at the end of the day, everything falls back to files. And so everything that you're doing with regards to data management in Hadoop today is based on files and file access control. So in this talk, I'll start by just going through how traditional data management has worked uh, in the data warehousing world. I'll talk a little bit about the Hadoop ecosystem and then talk about some of the challenges that we face within that ecosystem. And then I'll go through, as a case study, what we've done at Natero to, to deal with data management. So the first question is, what do I mean when I say data management? And we break that into two categories. The first is answering the question of what data do you have? So <clears throat> understanding what data sets exist in your Hadoop cluster, where are they stored, where are they being kept, and what properties do they have? So this is things like understanding the schema of the data, if it has a schema, understanding who created that data, when they created it, what kind of data is in there, all of the metadata that you want to be able to collect about your data. The second set of questions are around, are you doing the right thing with your data? And these are questions like, who's allowed to access this data? And furthermore, once you have that in place, who has access to the data? Having audit logs of your data is very important for compliance reasons. Along the same lines is, what did they do with that data? So what processing did they do with that data? Did they copy that data somewhere? And then finally, what rules need to be applied to that data? So being able to track retention things and compliance things that you need to have on that data to make sure that you're following all the proper procedures. So in the traditional stack, it looks a bit like this. You've got external data sources, which tend to be transactional systems, point of sale, customer you know, management systems. And these tend to get ETL'd into your data warehouse. And the data warehouse is sort of the resting place. It's where you keep the data. It's where you manage the data. And the data warehouse has two really interesting properties. The first is that data processing and data storage are tightly integrated. So in the data warehouse, you don't refer to things based on the path that they live in. <clears throat> Instead, what you do is you specify through a language what tables you want to access, what processing you want to do on that, which allows the data warehouse to provide you with tight controls on that data. You can even go down and say, OK, these columns you're allowed to see, these columns you're not allowed to see. The second thing that a data warehouse gives you is it gives you a very narrow interface. The only way that you can access data is through SQL. And this also has the same kind of properties that it prevents people from doing things that you don't want to do with their data. So the lessons that we want to draw from this and, and eventually apply to Hadoop are two. The first is that data requires the right abstraction. So things like schemas, you don't want them to be limiting. You don't want to enforce the requirement of those things because that is sort of the promise of Hadoop. But they do have value. And the second thing is that you have to have an abstraction that's easy to reason about. Right? Tables are easy to reason about because you don't have to understand where the data resides. You can simply refer to it by name. You can refer to it by column. And you can get access to that data. The second piece is the narrow interface. So what's nice about SQL is it defines both the data sources and the processing that you're going to do on that data, which means that users don't have to understand where and how the data is kept, and you can understand what they're going to do with that data when they access it. So let's shift and talk now about the Hadoop ecosystem and co contrast this to traditional data warehouses. So in the Hadoop ecosystem, at a high level, it looks very similar. You have the same sort of external data sources. You have a storage layer. You have a processing layer. 
And you even have tools on top of that that are trying to assist with some of this data management. But there are a number of challenges that still exist, and I'll go through some of them. The first is that there are a lot more data sources that we're dealing with when we're talking about Hadoop. And so unlike the traditional world where you might just have internal data, you're also trying to collect things like email data and even external data like Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds, and you want to integrate all of this information into a coherent view of your customer or of your product or whatever it happens to be. And the end result is that the, the complexity of data management grows because you have a lot more different requirements on the data, and you have to be very careful about when people are mixing data, how they're accessing that data, and how they're processing that data. The second piece is that data can be accessed through multiple entry points. So unlike a data warehouse where you have to access things through that table abstraction, in Hadoop there's a, a whole slew of different ways that you can process data. You can use MapReduce, or you can use Pig, you can use Hive, and there are more and more of these things coming online every day. And tools like HCatalog or Uzi are there to assist you in managing the processes and managing the data, but they don't actually enable any kind of enforcement, which means that you can hope that people are doing the right thing, but you don't actually know it. The third thing is that the problem is complicated even more by the number of additional users that are coming online. So if you heard the, the folks from Salesforce this morning mention that they want to bring 1,000 people onto their Hadoop cluster. So now you've got more different kinds of data, more ways that people can be processing the data, a lot more consumers of the data. And so the problem for someone who's actually trying to manage this has just grown exponentially. And the one lever that people have today in Hadoop is files. The only way that you can actually put any kind of access control on things is to set the correct permissions on the files, not only when you bring data into the system initially, but also as you're processing data, writing data out, as it moves through that pipeline of processing, you need to be very careful about what you're doing at each step. So we've proposed four steps to try and enable data management in this kind of environment. The first is to try and provide access at the right level, and this probably doesn't mean files. What it means is you need to understand your data and its schema and its uses. The second is to limit the processing interfaces. If you have people running raw MapReduce in your cluster, they can really do whatever they want, and they can write that data out however they want. And so you need to understand what you're going to do with that data and choose the right processing interfaces. The third step is that schemas and provenance really can provide a lot of control over the data. So understanding what's in your data so that you can place the correct access controls, as well as understanding how that data is actually moving through your Hadoop cluster and, and understanding the lineage of that data can give you a lot of control over what policies you apply. And then the fourth is to really enforce policy. And this is something that's, that's really missing from Hadoop today, is there's no way to enforce policy. There's no way to lock the system down and make sure that people are doing the, the right things. So now I'll shift gears a little bit, and I'll talk about what we do at Natero and, and why it makes a good case study for data management. So Natero is a cloud-based analytics service. And what we do is we try to enable business users to take advantage of big data. And so we offer a UI-driven process through which business users can create workflows and, and process their data in a managed way. And so what's interesting about Natera for this talk is that we run a single shared Hadoop ecosystem. So we need not only to have customer level isolation, because each of our customers have their own data sets that need to be separately managed, but those customers also have internally analysts and business users and other users of the data, and they need to be able to put separate controls on each of those groups as well. So we have a tiered hierarchy of control that we need to manage. And the goals are, one, to provide the appropriate level of abstraction for our users. So we want things to be easy for the user of the system, 
so they don't have to spend time figuring out where data resides, how they can and, and should access it, and so forth. The second is to provide a finer granularity of access control. So again, files are often not the right answer. You know, if you have a, a, a file that is really a structured JSON blob, for example, and it has a social security number in one of the fields, it might be perfectly reasonable to give someone access to everything except for that social security number. But at the file granularity, you don't have that level of control. The third piece is to enable policy enforcement. And what this means is not only providing the tools that enable management, but also making sure that people have only that one option through which they can access and, and process things in the system. And then the final piece is that users shouldn't have to think about policy. You know, if you have an analyst who's trying to use the cluster to do processing, he doesn't want to have to think about, oh, the data I'm reading from this source and the data I'm reading from that source you know, have different policies, so I need to apply this policy to the output and so forth. That, that's going to be too much for most people to think about. And so what we have is what we call source-driven policy management, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So now let me revisit the Hadoop picture I showed on the previous slide and talk about how we've modified it to enable our application stack. So the first thing we did was we locked down the Hadoop cluster. Users no longer interact directly with Hadoop. Instead, what users do is they submit jobs through a two-layer hierarchy. The first is what we call an access-aware workflow compiler. What this does is it understands what data sources users are allowed to access, and it understands how to take a job definition that they specify and convert that into things that can be run in the cluster. The second piece, which is the Providence Aware Scheduler, is actually responsible for running those jobs. And so the user no longer interacts directly with Hadoop. <coughs> Excuse me. Instead, he submits jobs through the compiler, which are eventually run by the scheduler, and the entire process is managed. The third piece that we've added is schema extraction. So whenever data comes into our cluster, we try to automatically extract whatever schema information might be available from the data. And it's the combination of this schema information, the policies that the IT staff are placing on, on the data, and the information about the execution, the provenance and lineage information that we're collecting, that ultimately enable us to enforce policy. And if you think about the four steps I talked about earlier, We've, we've really gone through each of them. So we've, <coughs> we've really integrated that processing and storage stack, just like in the data warehouse, and chosen an abstraction that works for us, which in this case happens to be workflows. We've also narrowed the interface down to a, a point where we can actually understand exactly what people are going to do on the cluster and how they're going to do it. And so users no longer have to think about files and locations. Instead, they think about data sources and workflows. The third piece is the, the schema extraction and provenance information that we're automatically collecting whenever a job's execute or data is brought into the system. And the fourth is to take all of these pieces to enable the policy execution and the enforcement, which ultimately makes sure that we're actually following the compliance and policy requirements. So I'll walk through a quick example uh, to give you guys a sense of how data flows through our application stack. So in this case, imagine that we have two sources of data. You could think of them as web and mobile. You could think of them as uh, web and CRM, whatever it happens to be. But as that data comes into the system, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to collect whatever schema information we can from those data sources and store it into a centralized metadata manager. Now, in our system, all the users operate through our UI. And so they define their jobs and workflows using the UI. And what's interesting about these jobs is that when they are specified, they specify the sources as one component, in this case, the, gr the green and purple boxes, and then the execution separately. 
And what this enables us to do is when the job compiler receives this job definition, it can actually check with the metadata manager and ensure that the user who's trying to execute on that data has the permissions to actually run this job. The job compiler then takes that definition and converts that into potentially a series of MapReduce jobs. Now these jobs may get run once, they may get run multiple times as new data comes into the system, and that's the responsibility of the scheduler. Now when the scheduler goes to run one of these executions, he has to check again to ensure that the policies on that data haven't changed. So it may be that the access controls have changed, <coughs> that the data has changed, and so you may not be able to run that job anymore. Assuming that you can, the scheduler is then responsible for executing the job, tracking the execution through the various uh, processing steps, and ultimately deciding where and how that output data should be stored. It then collects whatever schema information it can from the output data and places everything back into the metadata manager. Now I had also talked about source-driven policy control. And what I'm talking about there is, let's imagine that in this case, this green data is actually very restrictive. Only a subset of your users are allowed to access or use that data. In that case, what you'd really like to have happen is that the output data also has those same restrictions. By tracking the lineage of the data through the processing steps, we're actually able to do that. We're able to understand what the most restrictive policies are on your data and then automatically apply those to the output. And what's especially nice about this is now users of the system don't have to think about policy. You have your, your administrators set policy on the source data, and those policies automatically work their way through the system to all of the sort of tangent data. So what we've enabled here is one fine-grained access control. Because we have all of the schema information, policy can be set down to the column level again. Two is we have auditing because we're able to understand where data is flowing through the entire system. So we have all the lineage, all of the understanding. We're able to enforce policy because we've locked down our cluster and made this narrow interface through which people can only execute jobs. And we've made it very easy for users because users now don't have to think about policy but are still able to do the right thing with the data. Now the decisions that we've made about our abstraction, about this workflow abstraction, obviously comes with trade-offs. So we've been able to gain a lot more control over our system because of this, and we're able to actually be compliant. But it means that you can't run raw MapReduce anymore. Um, you know, you, it, random executions are not gonna work in our environment. Uh, and you know, that may or may not work for you. You'll, you have to un really understand what kinds of executions you want to productize and then think about that as you're developing your data management strategy. So I think there's a number of projects out there that are worth watching if you're interested in this space. So I'll just go through each of them briefly. The first is H Catalog. And today H Catalog is really around data discovery, schema management. And I would say that in a lot of ways H Catalog fits into the same vein as our metadata manager. The problem is that H Catalog doesn't actually do any enforcement. It's more of a guide and an assist than it is an actual way to ensure data management. Similarly, Falcon, which uh, is a pretty new project that just made its way into the incubator, uh, is about lifecycle management. And again, using Falcon, you can develop these workflows and come up with ways of replicating your data and managing your data. But again, it's a guide. It doesn't actually provide any kind of enforcement. And so <clears throat> that's why I think this third project is particularly interesting, Knox. Uh, and it's early days for Knox, but Knox provides centralized access control. It actually does some kind of enforcement. It limits what people can, can see and access ac across different Hadoop clusters. And I think ultimately taking Knox and integrating it with some of these other projects is gonna be an interesting way to combine data management the way it is now with actual enforcement. And then the last project I'll mention is the Cloudera Navigator. 
which today is really focused on auditing and, and helping people understand some of that lineage information. Uh, you can watch when people access data and where, when they write data and sort of start to create an understanding of, of the process. And I think they're also moving in a lot of these directions. And so that's another area I think will be interesting to watch. So I'll wrap up with just a, a few lessons learned. Um, the first is that if you want control over your data, you also need to get control over your data processing. So it's not enough just to deal with files. You really need to understand what people are doing with that data and where they're placing the output data. And metadata is extremely important to this process. Without collecting that provenance information and schema information, you're not really gonna understand what people are doing and where the data is being kept or be able to provide the kind of fine-grained control that in a lot of cases you need. And then the last piece is that your users are definitely not motivated by policy. Um, and you wanna really, th I mean, some of the point of Hadoop is to democratize data, is to give people more access to more data, more understanding. Um, but you still need policy. So you need to figure out how to enable policy without having it get in the way of users. Um, and our thought process around that is that you might be able to get your administrators and IT staff to reason about your data sources. And so if you can leverage provenance to really push policy down from, from the sources, it might be an easier way to deal with the problem. So at this point, uh, I'll take questions. Um, I've been asked to remind everyone to speak directly into the microphone, so. Could you explain, please, what your metadata means? provenance and schema, or how do you work with that, and how do you organize it, and how does it coexist with other metadata? I see. So for us, metadata means a couple of things. So if you think about the source data, generally, the first thing that you think about is the schema of that data. And what that means is, let's say you take some kind of semi-structured, like tab-separated, comma-separated, JSON, they all have a schema to them. And so capturing that information and codifying it into a central location allows you to place policies on that information and, and track, you know, by attribute what people are allowed to see and what they're not allowed to see. The second thing, which is about the provenance, is understanding how data flows. So if you have data A and data B, understanding that B was derived by processing data A helps you understand whether the data in B is still sensitive. And so understanding how data is flowing, because if you think about Hadoop in contrast to a data warehouse, a data warehouse is really about a single SQL execution. Hadoop is about processing the data in a series of steps. It's pipelined. And as a result, you have a lot more steps, a lot more data moving through the system. And so you really have a much harder job and you really need to track how that data is moving. Um, and then I guess the, the final piece is really just about, <coughs> excuse me, the, the traditional things you might think about such as specifically what policies need to be applied to data, so tracking those things as metadata, understanding who created the data, who owns the data, all the traditional sort of file-based metadata as well. So is your access layer your metadata, or is that homegrown solution, or, or what, what exactly, and how much work was it to build that thing? Yeah, so everything that I talked about was homegrown. Um, and it's, it's varying levels of work. Um, so in terms of the metadata collection, a lot of that is, is built into our connectors. So for example, that was something we were gonna have to build anyway. Um, the centralization of metadata, uh, you know, at the time that we started the work, H catalog was not where it is today. And so I think if you were starting from scratch, you would probably want to look carefully at that. Um, in terms of the enforcement piece, that I think is something that you need to think about carefully because we spent a lot of time on the choosing the right abstraction for our users. And that's not something that I think is really transferable, right? I, I think that ultimately, depending on what you want to be able to do with your data, you need to pick the right level of abstraction. And, I think I had it on one of the slides. You know, we started investigating ways of integrating, you know, pig scripts and, and hive queries with some of the work that we've done around metadata. Um, and I think that you could try to go that route. But the broader you allow people to execute data, the more difficult it is to track and manage. So I think 
that's probably where you're going to spend the most of your time, and you'll have to figure out what makes sense for your application. Okay, well, thank you very much.